How many of you know a second language? I mean really know a second language so that you can fluently speak it and understand it. Maybe you grew up in a bilingual home and learned two languages from a young age. Maybe you're like me and took language classes in high school. <laughs> I seem to remember getting A's in both French and German, but darned if I can remember more than a dozen words from the two put together. At this point, you should have taken enough anatomy to appreciate that anatomy, as a discipline, has its own distinct language as well. And, much like my pathetically weak recollection of French and German, it's easy to forget much of this language if you don't use it on a regular basis. That's where this podcast comes in. It serves as a review of the terms you likely have already learned and which will be considered prerequisite knowledge, but have possibly forgotten. So strap in and gear up as we review basic anatomical terminology. Good day, and welcome to the first of two review podcasts. In this podcast, our focus will be a review of anatomical terminology. This is probably a good way to start the course. Not only does it serve as a review of previous material, it'll also help you to get used to the format of these podcasts so that when we explore anatomy at a deeper level, you'll hopefully be more comfortable with the form of delivery. Now, before we jump in, I wanted to make a few brief points about how the material in this course is going to be delivered. Previously, you studied anatomy using a systemic approach, meaning that you would study the skeletal system and learn all the bones of the body before moving on to the muscular system, where you learned all the muscles of the body. In the circulatory system unit, you studied the heart and all the blood vessels. In the nervous system, you studied the brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nerves. You get the idea. As with most upper-level anatomy courses, this course will be taught using a regional approach. This means that we will spend a lesson studying the arm, for example, in which we'll consider the humerus, the elbow flexor and extensor muscles, and the arteries, veins, and nerves that pass through this region. Following this discussion, we'll move on to the forearm and study all the bones, muscles, and arteries, veins, and nerves in this region before we move into the hand. There's a few reasons that we take this approach. First of all, you should have already taken a lower level undergraduate class, which is almost certainly taught using a systemic approach. This gives you an opportunity to study the material in a different perspective and reinforce what you've already learned. Second, and probably most importantly, all of you are pursuing careers where injuries may occur or have already occurred. These injuries don't occur in isolated systems. Let's use an example. Imagine that you're working with an exercise program with an elderly patient, and during a session, they fall and break their humerus. Now, obviously, you're thinking about the bone already, location of the fracture, fracture type, proper alignment of the segments. But you also have to be giving thought to the other structures close to the fracture site, arteries and nerves, for example. What are the clinical implications should a fractured piece of bone sever one of these structures? Clinicians need to think about these regional anatomical relationships all the time to avoid overlooking complications related to injuries or disease, as well as to recognize what we call red flags or a danger signs for an underlying medical condition, which often involves structures surrounding the primary cause of the disease. Finally, and more practically speaking, we use a regional approach because this is a dissection class and it's much easier to dissect body regions than body systems as a whole. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's review some basic anatomical concepts, starting with anatomical position. With the language of anatomy, terminology assumes the body to be in anatomical position. Briefly, the body is in a standing position with the feet shoulder width apart and the head gaze, and toes pointing forward, and all hinge-type joints extended to a position of 180 degrees. Pretty basic standing position, really, except for the position of the hands, perhaps. In anatomical position, the hands are in an open position with the palms facing forward. Not exactly a natural standing position when you think about it. So why do we make this distinction? It has to do with the position of the radius and ulna during pronation and supination. In the pronated position, with the palms facing medially, the radius and ulna are crossed, making it difficult to describe the position of the two. Higher up, the radius is outside the ulna, while further down, it's more in front. This problem disappears as supination. When the palm is facing forward, the radius is outside of the ulna along its entire length. We therefore use this as anatomical position to avoid ambiguity. One last note to make about anatomical position. 
In the next podcast, we will be talking about the various movements generated by the musculoskeletal system, including flexion and extension. Note that, in anatomical position, all of the relevant joints are considered to be in a fully extended position. Any further extension, such as seen in the neck to look at the ceiling, would be considered a form of physiological hyperextension. The reason that anatomical position is so important is related to positional terms, which allows us to describe the positions of anatomical structures relative to one another. Most of these terms appear in pairs and carry specific meanings. Superior and inferior relate to structures that are closer to the head and feet, respectively. It's not uncommon to also hear the terms cranial and caudal, meaning towards the head or tail, in place of superior and inferior. Anterior and posterior relate to forward and backward positions. In this particular instance, we can also use the directional terms ventral and dorsal. Medial is used to describe the structures closer to the midline, while lateral is in reference to structures further away from the midline of the body. A third term that is closely related to this pair is median. Occasionally, when discussing three sets of structures, median will refer to the structure closest to or directly along the midline, giving us median, medial, and lateral structures relative to the midline. Another set of terms is used exclusively with the upper and lower limbs. Proximal structures are found closer to the torso, while distal structures are found further along the limbs. In describing the position of structures related to the surface of the body, superficial relates to structures that are found closer to the surface of the body, while deep relates to structures found closer to the body core. In instances where three structures are described, the middle layer is often characterized as being intermediate to the other two. Finally, there are special terms related to the hands and the feet. The palmar and dorsal surfaces describe the palm and back of the hand, respectively. Similarly, plantar and dorsal surfaces describe the soles and the tops of the feet. Note that many of these terms can also be used in combination as compound words to provide a clear understanding of their location. To give an example, we'll be spending time describing the abdominal oblique musculature later in the course. This region is found midway between the anterior and lateral abdominal wall regions. Consequently, it's generally referred to as the anterolateral abdominal wall. The importance here is in recognizing that all of these terms relate to the body while it is considered to be an anatomical position, regardless of the actual position of the body. This creates a standard universal reference point that is consistent for all situations. You'll be using these terms a lot in reference to the cadavers that you'll be dissecting in the course. And let's face it, barring some sort of zombie apocalypse, these bodies will never be in anatomical position. But it's still appropriate to refer to the head as being superior to the pelvis, despite the fact that both structures are lying flat on a table. Next, we review the planes of the body. We can think of these as imaginary flat surfaces that pass through the body in a specific orientation. We can subdivide them into one of four categories depending on this orientation. Sagittal planes pass from anterior to posterior, dividing the body into left and right segments. Sagittal planes uh, can be at any point along the body, but in the particular instance where it is directly within the midline of the body, it's given the special name mid-sagittal or median plane. You'll often hear the term parasagittal for planes that aren't midsagittal, but by convention, this isn't necessary. A frontal or coronal pane passes vertically from left to right, dividing the bodies into anterior and posterior segments. A transverse or horizontal plane passes horizontally through the body, dividing it into top and bottom segments. You should also note that radiologists will commonly use the term transaxial or simply axial to describe this plane. So if you encounter an axial image, recognize that this is a horizontal section through the body. Oblique planes would cover any plane that doesn't fall into any of these other three categories. Another concept that you should be comfortable with is laterality. The term unilateral refers to one side of the body only, while the term bilateral refers to both sides of the body. This comes into play, for example, when discussing unpaired versus paired organs, respectively. The liver, for example, is an unpaired organ found unilaterally in the upper white quadrant of the abdomen, while the kidneys are bilaterally paired organs. Another pair of terms you will see from time to time are ipsilateral, meaning on the same side of the body, and contralateral meaning on the opposite side of the body. You're probably familiar with the concept that each cerebral hemisphere controls the opposite side of the body, right? 
So damage to one hemisphere, let's say from a stroke, would result in contralateral paralysis of the body. On the other hand, if you were to sever a peripheral nerve in the arm, let's say you fall on a shard of broken glass, this would result in ipsilateral paralysis to the muscles that the nerve supplies. From an early age, we have all been made familiar with colloquial terms used to describe body parts. Head and shoulders, knees and toes, right? In some cases, we have multiple terms for the same region of the body, some of which can be very colorful and many of which probably shouldn't be using at all. The problem is that these are anglophonic terms that are specific to English-speaking regions. This creates problems with anatomical or clinical discussions with scientists and physicians from non-English-speaking regions. For this reason, an international standard on human anatomical terminology has been developed. Terminologica anatomica, as it is referred to, was last revised in 1998 by the Federative Community on Anatomical Terminology and the International Federation of Association of Anatomists. It effectively governs the proper use of the anatomical structures and it will be the standard for this course. The following chart provides a guideline for identifying the appropriate names for body regions. You should be familiar with this chart from the very start of the course as it will allow you to properly identify the regions we are working in, as well as the location or function of anatomical structures with similar root names. As we move through the course, we'll encounter a number of exotic sounding anatomical names with their root in Latin or Greek text. Students are encouraged to consult a medical dictionary or even just Google the term to learn about its origin and meaning, which more often than not describes the shape, size, or function of the structure. In many instances, the italicized English translation will immediately follow the term in parentheses in the notes. I find this helps students remember the term and associate it with the characteristics of the structure they are looking at. While our focus will be on proper anatomical terminology in the classroom, it's still important to be well versed and comfortable with all the colloquial terms you are likely to encounter. This is of importance understanding clients or patients when they ask questions about their ailments and also in providing clear explanations that your client or patient will be able to understand. You'll also find that even in a professional setting, older clinicians will make use of outdated terms, including eponyms, which are terms related to an individual or anatomist rather than to a characteristic of the structure. Probably the most famous example of this would be the Achilles tendon instead of calcaneal tendon. And no word of a lie, old school clinicians will haze newly practicing students and graduates that use the newer language. So even among colleagues, you have to be careful about what terms to use. Not to worry, however, I plan to point out many of these dated terms so that you don't look like so much of a noob when thrown into a clinical placement. Okay, this is a pretty good place to end this first review session. The second review session will focus more on anatomical concepts related to the biomechanics of human movement. Until then, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.